It's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode 44. Today, we're going to be talking about a, uh, a new addition to the Ragusea kitchen you might have seen. Very large, very brightly colored, extremely heavy, and we will, we will be discussing whether it was worth the prodigious cost of bringing this new thing into our home, um, and whether it was responsible for a certain other person who's here to expend those funds. Sure. <laughs> it took me a second to follow that sentence around. <laughs> you and everybody else, honey. Uh, my lovely wife, Lauren, is here. And before we get to all of that, we're going to do some chat about salt, some practical talk about salt and how salt is indicated in recipes that we have not discussed previously. So, uh, honey, if you could do me a favor and read that uh, question there from an audience member. Sure. Hey, Adam, Nathan here. I'd like to ask you about salt. Isn't there scientific studies about the quantity of salt we use or should use daily? Why do recipes always say salt to taste? Should we taste the raw pie dough to adjust the salt? It's not the same thing. In restaurants, they just salt your food, presumably to their taste, and it works. So why can't recipes have the amount of salt we should use? Okay, so first we have to untangle what does it mean, season to taste, salt to taste? Like, how do you interpret that, honey, when you see that in a recipe? Until it tastes good to me. <laughs> what if it's something that you can't taste? Usually things you can't taste don't say salt to taste, I find. So baked goods. He mentions like pie crust yeah. specifically. Yeah. I feel like they don't say salt to taste. They Baked goods usually give you salt. And you, I mean, you personally consider like, did I use salted butter? I always use salted butter. So I like salted a little less. Mm -hmm. But if it's a sweet baked good, I like a little salty edge. So I put a little salt in. Right. Because you can't suppl put supplemental salt right. into a baked good after you. It's, it's already baked into the cake, as it were. I will say, I have seen you on more than one occasion pick up a chocolate chip cookie, sprinkle it with salt, oh. and eat it. So. Heterogeneity. <laughs> sure. <laughs> love it. Love it. I think there's a, there's a fundamental ambiguity in the phrase salt to taste because I think you could interpret it to mean, yes, keep adding salt until it tastes good to you, mm -hmm. right? Which you can do with lots of things. It's hard to do that with cake batter, though yes, absolutely, Nathan, I frequently, especially when I'm developing recipes for the channel, I will taste raw batters all the time. I'll put in a little bit of salt, taste the raw batter. If it feels like it needs more salt, I'll put in a little bit more salt. And it's obviously- just a matter of time. <laughs> obviously there is, there's, there's a you know, relatively minor risk of foodborne illness there from the raw eggs and from the raw flour. Um, but, you know- People eat how many gallons of raw cookie dough a year? And, uh, well, some of them probably do get sick. Some of them get sick and then are, don't even connect it to the cookie dough. Indeed, exactly. <laughs> um, n nor would you, given that there are incubation periods for foodborne infections. And so it could be days or weeks or even months later that you actually get really? sick. Yeah. And so you wouldn't oh. know. Uh, what made you sick? Yeah, people never, people I never it know was what like made them sick. Pretty standard, like twenty four hours. That's for food poisoning, which is a different thing. Really? Technically, yes. And I, met, oh. I'll do a whole pod about this, or a whole video, or something. Yeah, I um, thought that was all one thing. So the way that like the the the, the schmientists say it is use the term mm -hmm. is uh, food poisoning is when you are hurt by the toxins that are generated. By the, bacteria, by the bacteria have been generated by the bacteria in the food. So the, the bacteria have been active in the food for a while, metabolizing stuff and then making these waste products that are toxic to us, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the classic example of that is like, um, you know, like a, san like a pre-wrapped sandwich in a convenience store. Oh, it's been festering. It's been sitting the around. Yeah, like the turkey has been sitting around at room temperature for a while. Or like a, the church potluck thing where- Oh, like the tuna salad or the deviled eggs. Yeah, it's been sitting in the sun all day, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. So in that case, what, you know, if, if the bacteria have been allowed to be <laughs> active in the food for a long time and have created a lot of toxin, then you eat it and it, it within like 12 hours or less than mm. that, actually, it'll, it'll actually, it'll make you sick. Um, and that's food poisoning and food poisoning is usually, it, it kills people. It absolutely kills people all the time. But the good thing about it is that it tends to like come in and then come out and, you know, <laughs> as it were, <laughs> so, so to speak. out of the course, over the course of a day or two, right? Mm. Whereas a foodborne infection is when what you get is like a large dose of live bacteria and 
your your you know, the acidity of your stomach and your immune system are not able to kill all of the living cells. They're able to kind of, you know, set up shop in various parts of your body and the incubation periods for those can be, you know, weeks. And the thing that sucks about those is that they also will generally last a lot longer than, you know, 24 hours. If you get, you get the throw ups and it's in and out in 12 hours, that was probably food poisoning. If it lasts longer than that, if, you know, uh, so the classic example would be norovirus. That's the most common one. Um, So that's a foodborne infection and that stays with you for like, that's like a a whole hellish week, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. So salt. It's real rough. So salt. <laughs> Good thing about salt is that it kills microorganisms uh, to a point, you know. Uh, but anyways, uh, the the risk the the risk for me of tasting a raw batter for seasoning is, I think, probably small. Mm. A, I'm you know a, a healthy grown you know middle aged man, right? I'm not old or a child. Um, or I, I'm not immunocompromised. And then it's also somewhat dose dependent. I mean, only it takes only like, I think something like six or eight live cells of salmonella to give you an infection. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's assuming they all survive the, like the trip into your body and you ha- your body has all of these systems to destroy them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so- I wish I hadn't just eaten lunch oh, now. <laughs> sorry, honey. <laughs> Anyway, mm. like a little, just like a, you know, a, a wet fingertip of batter is a tiny, tiny dose. And so even if there's like live salmonella in there, the odds of me getting enough of them to really hurt me are kind of low. So I taste raw batters for seasoning. I'm not going to tell you that you should do that, Nathan, mostly because I don't want the legal liability. But also <laughs> what's the one-to-one on like a batter to finished cake? Can you really t- tell that much? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, because all the, you know, the finished cake is going to have a little bit less water in it. Mm. And other than that, it's, it's sort of, you know, okay. and more air, you know, but other than that, it's kind of it. Right. So you, you can take, you can tell pretty well, unless you're going to be like putting something salty on it. Mm. So like the classic example of that being like pizza, mm. where there's pizza, there's pizza makers who put no salt in their dough. Right. Or, or a tiny, tiny amount, mm-hmm. because the 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 you know salt affects the function of gluten, and some people may feel that their dough is just you know has better rheological properties uh, without any salt in it, and it doesn't need salt because you're going to put salty cheese on it, mm-hmm. and it all it's all going to go into your mouth at the same time, and it's all gonna all gonna work out in the wash as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem with that is that that's if you've ever had a pizza where the cornice, the like the thick fluffy dough around the edge is just really bland and you don't even want to eat it at all, yeah. right? Yeah, I feel like. But I'm, in those cases, sometimes then they'll brush brush the crust brush something on stuff. it. Yeah, that would be which would be a good move. Yeah, that you'd get the best of both worlds. Good thinking, honey. <laughs> Thanks. Thinking like a <laughs> chef over here. I can't imagine where I would have gotten such notions. Uh, I take full credit. <laughs> full credit. Um, so, w- w- yes, salt to taste could mean add in salt until you like it, which is very easy to do with like a soup or a stew or something mm-hmm. like that. Super easy to do. Um, the way that I usually season practically and the, the way that I sort of demonstrated in videos usually is that like I'll, I'll say I'm going to start with a little bit of salt. Like I get the stew going. I'm going to put in a, you know, a pinch or two of salt just to get it going. You get a stew going. Get a stew going. <laughs> Baby. <laughs> That's for like five people out there. <laughs> but you're my people if you're among the five. You're our people. <laughs> uh, anywho, uh, so you, you put this uh, – the thing is, is like food does absorb salt as it cooks. And so if you want your vegetables or your meat or whatever to actually absorb some seasoning, you want to have some salt in the stew from the, from the get-go. However, it, it pays to be conservative in that case because you can't really taste it and know what it's going to taste like at that point. You have to wait to taste into the end to really see how much mm-hmm. salt you actually want. So I always start with a conservative baseline to absorb into the bits. And then I'll add some more to the sauce or the broth or whatever at the very end to taste. And I, that literally means putting in a little tasting it, putting a little more tasting it. Do you do that when you cook these days? Um, I... I tend to put in salt one time and then I taste it at the end. And usually what happens is then I go, Adam, can you come taste this? 
<laughs> Tell me if it needs more salt. Which is really I, weird I considering that like it's myself. your dinner. I know, you but know? I, I second guess myself. I don't know. I also know that you like a lot more salt than I do. Mm -hmm. Which is dumb then that I'm asking you because I could always you could just put more salt in your bowl. Indeed, yes. Sure could. But because I also like to have some unevenly distributed salt for the purposes of the H word. <laughs> Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I think like a big theme in my cooking, less so lately though, is that I just second guess myself and I just need someone else to tell me that it's right. Right. So I, that's what you're here for. <laughs> sure. I call you along and be like, yeah, that's fine. Glad is to this, have some job around here. Is this meat done enough? Is this just, are these vegetables cooked enough? Does this taste right? Yeah. Does it look right? Yeah. That's what you're here for. <laughs> the funny thing is that in those situations, like I try, I try to think to myself, like, she knows the answer. There's already a correct answer in her mind. My job here is to try to figure out what the correct answer is that she's already thinking of and to parrot it back to her. No, that's not right, though. You really? do that and that drives me crazy because I, what I like sometimes what happens is I'll say, what should I do next when I'm cooking? And you'll go, I don't know. Uh, and, I, and then I just – and I have to be like – if you were cooking it, what would you do next? You son of a bitch. <laughs> and you're like, because you, you want, I think what you're trying to say is like, trust yourself. There's mm. no correct answer. You can wing it. It's fine. But what I want is someone to just jump me the thing. <laughs> That's why I like recipes and you less so. Mm -hmm. I love to be like, what's the next step? Well, all of this is very pertinent to Nathan's question. Mm -hmm. So the other way that you could interpret the instruction salt to taste is put in as much salt as your taste would dictate. Like mm -hmm. uh, however however salty you tend to like things, right. put on the salt. Right. right. And what Nathan is asking is why why would recipes tell you to do that when excessive salt consumption comes with all kinds of potential health risks that we have discussed on a previous podcast episode about whether or not salt is actually bad for you, which I would encourage folks to go and listen to if they haven't. Um, and it, But it's true that absolutely lots of people probably get too much salt, especially people who, for mostly genetic reasons, probably have salt-sensitive hypertension. A little bit of more salt in their diet really dramatically raises their blood pressure, um, which is the bad thing. The good thing is that all they have to do is cut out a little bit of salt in their in their diet, and their blood pressure goes down considerably, mm -hmm. which is which is good. But that's that's some minority of the human race it has salt-sensitive hypertension. Um, do most recipes, Nathan, like? tell you exactly how many, you know, what your macronutrients are and what your calories are and all that kind of stuff. No, it's right? It's a fundamental difference in the view of what food should be. Yeah. Like I'm cooking to eat something that will taste good to me. And like the I think the recipe writers are like it's on you to figure out if you should be eating meat right now or fat right now right. or salt right now. Unless <laughs> unless that is the whole point of their content, right? Right. If it is, if, if it's, it's a like low a, sodium cookbook or a keto cookbook or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, a, a channel that is focused on, uh, yeah, super high protein eating or super low salt eating or whatever, right? Then they're going to like do the math and try to tell you essentially how much of all of the key nutrients is, is, is in your food. But other than that, like recipes don't really concern themselves with that. Right. We sort of assume that you're a grown up and you can figure out how much you should be eating of, of what or not. Right. Um, so that's one reason. Why. And also, like, we, you know, I don't want the liability of being responsible for your salt intake. Right. right? If I say that this amount of salt is healthy, and that's true for most people, but for a minority of people, that much salt will make them sick, then... Right. If, you, if you're going to do a, a cookbook with that kind of, you know, health focus, at that point, you, like, you have to bring in, like, lawyers and stuff. To make sure that it's it's all legit and it's you're not going to get into trouble. Or you don't. And you just ride the risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some people do that on the internet, I see. And they sometimes find themselves on the wrong end of a lawsuit. <laughs> the other thing, the other reason that I would say salt to taste in a recipe, and I do that all the time, mm -hmm. is that I also don't want to be responsible for guessing how much salt you're going to want. Because as you alluded to, honey. Yeah, you like more salt. Yeah. Salt preferences are tremendously variable on the individual level. 
And even over the course of like your life, like if you're eating a lot of salt, you can chronically desensitize yourself to it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I've noticed on, you know, times when I've gone on in, inadvisable crash diets <laughs> where I eat, you know, very little and, and just don't get enough, don't get, you know, hardly any salt for a long time. And then I'll eat a taste of pizza pizza and it will taste unbearably salty to mm. me. Just the, just the mozzarella, you know, will taste so, so salty to me. Um, so you can desensitize yourself to salt. Um, salt, there's a heap of research showing that like salt sensi taste sensitivity depends <clears throat> on all kinds of other factors like the pH of the food you're having it in, the temperature of the food you're having it in, all kinds of stuff affect how much salt is going to taste to you, how strongly salt is going to taste to you. And so I just can't predict how much salt you're going to want. Furthermore, there's the measurement challenge, right? So here's our, you know, I'll hold up for, for those of you watching the, the program on home video. Um, <laughs> our salt cellar. Here's our salt, our, our salt cellar. And what kind of salt do we have? What kind of salt family are we? Kosher salt. What brand do we have in this house? Morton. Morton Kosher. All right. We are a Mo Morton Kosher family. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, that's the one with the girl with the umbrella. Right? With the umbrella. Okay. That's I, I like the emphasis on the first syllable. I would say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so the thing about Morton Kosher is that the, the, the flakes are really large and irregular. And so it takes up a lot of space. There's just a lot of air in this, in a teaspoon of Morton Kosher salt. And so it measures really differently than finer salts. And yeah, you know, I think there was like a period when the only salt anyone used in their kitchen in the United States, at least was Morton iodized, uh, iodized table salt, right? Which is yeah. the tiny little uniform cubes. Yeah, because you would put it in your little salt shaker. Yeah. And people, there was a period when that was like the only salt we had, <laughs> um, unless you were Jewish in the United mm -hmm. States. And and so I think recipes around that time gave really specific volumetric measurements, like a half teaspoon of table salt or whatever, mm -hmm. because that's that stuff is pretty easy to measure out consistently. But now that everybody's got all kinds of differently shaped salts, mm -hmm. you can't measure them accurately by volume at all, by teaspoon or something like that. Mm -hmm. You really have to measure them by weight. And you might think, oh, well, sure, yes, I'm, I'm one of these new cool kids who... Mm -hmm always measures everything by weight in the kitchen, but you're not going to measure the salt by weight. <coughs> Scales are only, any kind of measurement device can only measure things within a certain range, right? And uh, however, like a pinch of salt to put into a recipe is way too small to get an accurate measurement for on a normal kitchen scale. You need one of these, which I'll hold up for the camera if you're watching this on home video. It's a jewelry scale. Uh, well, <laughs> for people who are not watching this on home video, people, uh, Lauren put her air quotes up <laughs> when she described it as a jeweler's scale, which is the name of it. It's called a jeweler's scale. I bought it at Walmart. It's ta Taylor. That's a brand you can get real easy here in the US and it's real cheap. And this is for measuring like fractions of a gram or a couple of grams or something like yeah. that. And mm -hmm. it's super... Super teeny <laughs> tiny. And I can't imagine what Why else. Why you'd it, need fractions of a gram, gram or a gram. Exactly. That's right. It's only for uh, dealing in precious metals. <laughs> that's right. Um, or measuring your salt. <laughs> or measuring your salt. Right. That's, that's what it's for. <laughs> Anywho. Um, and like most people don't have one of these. Like a lot of people at this point have a scale, but most people don't have a quote unquote jeweler's scale, which is the only way you're going to get an accurate measurement of your salt. Mm -hmm. Like tr if you don't believe me, try it. Like go to your go to your scale in your kitchen and just start putting in one tiny pinch of salt after another. And probably it'll just say zero for a while. And then it'll like jump from zero to two grams or something like that. Can we talk about the line in his um, question uh -huh. where he says, in restaurants, they just salt your food presumably presumably to their taste and it works. And this, Does it work? That was interesting to me because your pet peeve is when we go to a fancy restaurant and they don't have salt on the table because they're like, well, we've made our food perfect. And you're like, I would like some salt, please. Yeah. Um, because you like more salt. I, I never want the extra salt. But you always want the extra salt. And, and it's high-end restaurants. Like if you... You, that's the divide. Yeah, if you go, if you go to if you go to Waffle House, 
there's oh, there's still salt salt shakers with and rice pepper in shaker. it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Salt with rice in it. The rice acts as a desiccant and keeps it from uh, clumping. clumping. Yeah, getting wet from atmospheric water and clumping. Um, and that's awesome. And all restaurants in the West, I think, used to have like salt and pepper at the table. And now, yeah, it's it's now that the the, the chef is not just he's an artiste. He's an artiste, right? And you you must submit to my vision. Well, I think it's less that the, I don't think it's my vision. It's like I think it has become acculturated that chefs take it as an insult if you ask for more salt mm-hmm. because right. they feel like I have undersalted the food. And me, I'm sitting there eating the same thing saying, I don't think you've undersalted it. It's perfect for me. Yeah. He just likes a lot of salt. Yeah. I think there is a uniquely male attitude there, frankly. Um, not to say like female chefs don't do this too, but I just think it's like it's a it's, it's kind of a thing. gendered thing where it's it's like – it only counts if I do it to you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you follow. <laughs> yeah, 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 I do. Okay. Anyway, salt. <laughs> anyway, salt. <laughs> um, so that's, that's why, like, as for me as a professional recipe writer at this point, I do not want to, to tell you how much salt. Because I don't know how you're going to measure it. I don't know how much salt you want. I, I don't know how much salt is good for your diet. Um, wow, we're getting a million <laughs> texts right now. Your mom is blowing us up. Oh, because like, she's sending um, the time hop videos of the kids. Oh, yeah. That's that's the main thing she does. I love them. Oh, I, do, I love them too. Yeah. She wishes that we would respond to them and say, I love them, but we just love them privately. I like, look at them and I'm like, oh, they're so cute. But we're supposed Old to- Old pictures of our kids is what we're talking yes. about here. That's that... From like your, I'm trying to find the do not disturb on my, oh, the theater faces, I think it is. That's okay. Theater mode. There we go. Now at least my watch won't ding. Yeah, right. I think the computer's going to ding though. Anyways, um, <laughs> and then to, to go, just to kind of swing back to your health question there, Nathan, um, we don't- we don't know. No one knows how much salt is optimal, right? Um, there's there's broad consensus in the medical and you know, public health communities that too much salt is bad for you, and that um, hypertension or high blood pressure, which is chiefly probably chiefly caused in the world these days by excess salt consumption, is like according to World Health Organization, the leading cause of preventable death in the entire world. And part of that is because of the insane amount of salt that's consumed in Asia. Like we on average eat something like three grams of salt a day in the United States, three mm-hmm. or four. It's more like 10 in Japan and China. Really? Yeah. Is that like, huh, that's interesting. Um, culture, long standing culture of fermented foods oh. where they're using salt to mediate bacterial activity. Got it. Yeah. Um, so soy sauce, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and then the funny thing about that is that it's like, yeah, so people in Japan eat way too much salt by, by uh, the standards of what the FDA is telling Americans to eat. But like, when you think of Japan, Quite do, you, ha- do you think of a bunch of unhealthy slobs? No. No. You, it's like the, they're like the longest lived people in, on earth. Hmm. Um, them and the French. Really? Yeah. I didn't know the French. That's a whole on- thing. Um, well, it's more that the French seem to have. I knew that French women don't get fat. F- the French seem to have a lot of outliers, like when, like like a lot of the the oldest people on record at any given time are have historically been in France, and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But I don't know. but like but I I actually have it's no the butter. It's the butter. I have actually no idea if the French are like statistically on a population level longer lived than uh, than other people, but the Japanese are a hundred percent like very long lived people. Um, which is not to say that like that's because of the salt. It could be in spite of the salt, right? The, so if they didn't eat the salt, they could live longer? Gastric cancer rates are considerably higher in Japan and China. And it's people generally assume that that's because of the excess salt consumption. Because a lot of that's, you know, that's mostly the bad thing that salt does to you is raise your blood pressure. But if your blood pressure is fine or if you're taking a pill, then you, it doesn't really matter that much. Mm. But another thing that salt does to you is that over a very long term, it can give you gastric cancer. And, and it's something, it's a cancer that people tend to get when they're really old anyway. Um, yeah. And, and that's, that's a thing. That's a real thing. But I, I have no idea. The point is that like no one, everyone agrees that too much salt is real. No one agrees. No scientists who study this agree on what the optimal amount of salt is for health purposes. And so I just would not, 
ever presume to lecture you on how much salt that you should be putting in your food, Nathan. Well, the one thing I can tell you is that everybody who studies this, they all say the same thing, which is that the problem is almost certainly not your home cooking. It is instead... Fast food. Yeah, fast food, ultra-processed, prepackaged food. That's where like... In the in the West, at least, that's where most people are getting the vast majority of their salt. Um, so I, I think if you're cooking at home, you're already doing it right. And I don't think that you probably shouldn't worry about it that much. Um, of course, now I'm worrying about it because your children eat so many happy meals. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Um, on the subject of uh, individual salt needs varying from person to person, um, if you are an athlete of any kind, uh, you might consider the sponsor of this episode, Element, which is spelled L-M-N-T, um, but is pronounced Element. 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 Element is a terrific sponsor of the program and a, a terrific product. This is a, an electrolyte drink or like a sports drink. Um, so, you know, uh, such things have been on the market for a long time and are tremendously useful to athletes or to anybody else who's just sweating a whole lot and expelling a lot of their electrolytes that they need in order to function. Or if you get the throw ups. Or if you get the throw ups, <laughs> yeah. Which is like have a, have a, ha, have a glass of Element after you get sick and. I mean, sick, sick, sick. Yeah. You'll be reborn. <laughs> and you will be reborn as I was after I had the flu and I drank some Element uh, like about a month ago. And that was awesome. So the cool thing about Element, though, is that it doesn't have any junk in it. There's no sugar. Um, it's sweetened with stevia, which is a, an alternative sweetener that is generally really well tolerated by people as opposed to things like sugar alcohols, which absolutely wreck you, honey. Um, yep. So maybe this, maybe I could have this. <laughs> I think you, I'm, I'm almost certain that you could. Um, so uh, it doesn't have any, it has any color. I mean, I'll, for those of you watching on home video, here's a glass of it. There's no colors. There's nothing that would be problematic for vegans. You know, uh, and anything that you could be sensitive to is not in here. It's just the electrolytes, a sweetener, uh, and a flavor, a flavoring agent to make like citric, like citric acid to make it go down well and the electrolytes that you need. Sodium, potassium, magnesium. This is one of the things I like about Element and why I was really quite happy to work with them when they approached me is that like other, you know, sports drinks companies try to market toward the general public. Yeah, to like who, take like, it in your lunchbox. Yeah, <laughs> and people who don't need probably don't need any more salt or, and those products have sugar too, don't need more salt and sugar in their, in their life. Element is really cool about saying like, look, we, you know, we are for athletes. They also uh, uh, say, you know, point out that their product might be good for people doing certain kinds of diets. So if you are doing something like a ketogenic diet or really any, any very, very low carbohydrate diet, your body is expelling even more sodium in that context. And it's also the case that like, if you're eating a strict diet and trying to lose a lot of weight really fast, maybe you're just not eating much food. And so I've been in situations where I'm diet dieting really hard and I'm cramping. I get muscle cramps because I don't, I'm not getting enough electrolytes. I'm not getting enough sodium and the others. And this is like a great thing for that too. So whatever your reasons are, if you have a reason to think that you might need some more electrolytes in your life, please go ahead and and look into sponsor of this episode, Element, which is spelled L-M-N-T. And if you go to my link, which is drinklmnt.com slash Adam, that's drinklmnt.com slash Adam, you can get a, a free Element sample pack, free sam sample pack that includes one packet of every flavor so that you can try out which flavors you're into. Uh, they offer no question asked refunds on all the orders. Uh, you don't even have to send the product back. If you don't like it, just tell them they'll give you your money back. Um, this offer can be claimed by first time and returning element customers. And it's exclusively available through uh, you know a link like mine. This is not something that you're going to find publicly on their website. So go to drinklmnt.com, drinklmnt.com slash Adam, drinklmnt.com slash Adam. Thank you, Element. Hey, Adam. My name is Omri, and recently I've taken a lot of interest in animal cast iron. I have a really fantastic, cheap Kmart casserole that has been working great, uh, but I do like to have fancy things. I noticed that you have a really nice yellow Le Creuset, um, but those things literally cost 10 times more. And I was wondering, is there actually such a big difference to justify the markup? Thank you. So, honey, um, how did that piece of cookware over there uh, wind up in, the, in our kitchen? Yeah, for the home do video you want me to viewers. Hoist it? Yeah, well, even people listening to the podcast are going to hear the effort involved. Ha! <laughs> huh, there it is. 
the drop it on my foot. Ah, okay, there you go. He said Le Creuset. Is, am I, are, are we supposed to say the T? I, I say Le Creuset. That's, that's just, what I've heard. That's just because I'm an intimidated American. And if there's, <laughs> if there's any letter in a French word that I, I'm worried about, I just, just don't leave, say it. Just leave it I out. I just leave it out. When in doubt, say nothing. Oh, God. <laughs> so heavy. So how did this new... Here, uh, here's the lid. <laughs> how did this new Le Creuset uh, pot, enameled cast iron Dutch oven, end up in our house? I bought it. I bought it? <laughs> bought it from William Sonoma. Um, we had a, a glass. Hashtag not an ad, by the way. Not, Le, Le Creuset, no. not You can not buy them sponsored. anywhere. Yeah. Um, we had a, a gla- an enamel cast iron um, Dutch oven that we got when we got married. Mm-hmm. We registered for it. Um, it did okay. It was great. No, it was too thin. The bottom was always too thin, and it yeah. got really bad hot spots. Okay. And then the enamel started chipping. Yes, but keep in mind that how long have we been married? Almost 16 years? Something like that. So, I mean, but we probably got it before we got married because we registered. So it's, I mean, it lasted 15 years. Yeah. And then recently I burned it real bad. <laughs> I burned Scorched the, the pan. I yeah. scorched the pan real bad. And I felt guilty and all, and so um, you needed a new pan yeah so i did a little research and i was trying to decide between this one and what is it Staub. it's another french brand so let's just go with (laughs) Staub. the reason and the reason we got this one over the Staub or whatever it is um is because the interior of those is black and we had to consider shooting and with you wanting to shoot inside the pan and be able to see the white interior was better and then um yeah, we bought it. It was five hundred and seventy-five dollars. Oh my god! Which is obscene. Which is not a thing I would have done. No. Um, then again, you know, you bought it, and you take you take the heat for having bought it. Yeah. But like, I've been the one shooting with it, and I love shooting with it. <laughs> it looks so pretty on camera. Yeah. I picked the yellow. Oh on my purpose. god! I picked the yellow. The, so the white interior and the yellow I thought would look really nice on camera. We have blue walls and a white kitchen. I thought the yellow would pop. It does. Um, yes. It looks so good. It does have a lifetime warranty. Mm-hmm. So if it chips, you can call up Blake Crusade. I don't know if they only give you your money back if you say it right. But um, they, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's meant to be the last glazed cast iron you ever buy. Right. So let's let's put the pod car in reverse <laughs> um, and define what is glazed or enameled cast iron. I, the, the, uh, the gentleman who asked the question, I liked how in his accent it kind of sounded like animaled cast iron. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a it like nice. animal print on it. It's got uh, like cheetah spots on it, which Very I, nice. I would take that. It sounded lovely. Yeah, it sounded lovely. Well, uh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so what it is, is it's just normal cast iron, but the what they do is they spray a, a mixture that contains teeny little bits of glass mm-hmm. onto it. And then they fire it in a kiln to melt that glass. And it's so it's literally it's so cast it's a iron. Nice sound. Yeah. There you, oh, <laughs> doing the a- Ragusi <laughs> ASMR. ASMR. Yeah. Go ahead. Lauren's gonna just she's gonna tap the enamel, the animal to cast <laughs> iron. It's gonna bring out the animal in you. But if you're looking on home video, as Grandpa Ragusia says, uh, you can see like the black is the cast iron, and yeah. then the yellow and the white is the enameled part. Right. Uh, so basically, it's cast iron covered in a particularly temperature tolerant, uh, heat tolerant glass. <laughs> and the advantage is that you don't have to do any of the things you normally do to care for cast iron. You do not have to season it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to worry about putting it in the dishwasher. You don't have to worry about it rusting. You don't have to worry about scrubbing it too hard um, because it does not. You could season it conceivably. I don't think a seasoning layer probably attaches, adheres very well mechanically to smooth glass, but um, it, it just requires no babysitting. Now, on the other hand, it is not naturally nonstick in the way that seasoned cast iron is mm-hmm. to the extent that seasoned cast iron actually is naturally nonstick, which is n- significantly overstated by people. Which was why I was able to scorch the other one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, and gosh, they're just so pretty. They're yeah. so darn pretty. And that's a particular feature of the Le Creuset 
family of products. Yeah, they've got the nice, like, the lid has the ombre, like it's darker and then it gets lighter. On the that's what that's side. called, an ombre? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, I, I'm amazed by the lid on the, uh, the handle on this lid. Oh, yeah. It doesn't get as hot. It's the, a metal lid that yeah. is weirdly... It does get warm and, like, if it's on for a long time, but, like, our other one had a metal um, handle on the lid and, like, it had a letter on it for the disgraced former chef who made it and if you grabbed it you could easily brand get a brand yeah it was like home alone like when he branded his hand on the door <laughs> totally yeah but they they use some kind of special non-conductive metal for the for the for the for the handle there and it's but awesome. don't still test it before you grab it don't like burn your hand yeah. and be like ragusia told me <laughs> oh so much liability in this episode <laughs> Oh, our, our lawyer is not going to be happy. <laughs> or he's going to be really happy, I guess. <laughs> Depends how you look at it, right? So um, Staub, the other big French brand of enameled cast iron cookware, it, it's so funny. Like if We you, do have a little one of those. We do? That's the um, the forest green one. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, that, like was that, a gi- that was a gift. That was a gift, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if you look on their like marketing materials, it they throw all kinds of like shade, implicit shade, at Le Creuset. Because, yeah. Because they're just like, we're we're not a fashion company. Like, <laughs> like, we're a tool company. And we have, like, four colors and glazes that we have formulated specifically to just work well and last forever. And that's mm-hmm. what we do here at the Staub Company, unlike certain other people. So, I mean, if, you're, if you don't care about shooting... Videos, video, video, yeah. then yeah, maybe the other one is great. No, no, Staub no. is very. Yeah. Assuming that's how you say it, I'm so sorry. Um, to all <laughs> Somebody the is friends. very angrily typing in the comments right yeah. now. <laughs> it's pronounced Staub. 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 I don't know. Um, Staub is still very expensive, but not as expensive as Le Creuset. I mean, I and it's a, a, like a hundred dollars cheaper. Yeah, yeah. It's still very, pricey. still very expensive. There are. Other ones on the market for much cheaper. So I don't know, but the reputation is that with the with the bargain um, enameled cast iron, uh, you know, and there's extensive Reddit threads you can consult for evidence <laughs> if that stands for evidence. Um, the, the reputation of those really cheap ones is that the enamel chips, the enamel is much more likely to chip. I don't know what they do at Le Creuset to make it so that their stuff never chips. But, you know, it might be a combination of the primer that they use with the particular glaze formulation they use. I don't know if they put on the glaze in like two coats or something like that. But whatever they do. Invite us to the factory, Le Creuset. We would love to come. Yes, we would. (laughs) Over there in France. (laughs) Get the whole family go to France. (laughs) Hey, y'all. We're from Tennessee. Bonjour. Bonjour. (laughs) Um, get out to jail (laughs) whatever they do seems to work the Mm -hmm. reputation on the internet is that the expensive french brands last for freaking ever and there's also some differences you can immediately feel so like the old cheaper one that we had the red one that you've seen in a million videos was too thin on the bottom Mm -hmm. um Contrary to popular belief, cast iron is not an even heat conductor. People think that it's it, it is it's not. So there's a million experiments you can see online where people will like dust a, you know a, a thin layer of flour onto the bottom of a cast iron pan and then heat up the pan and, then and you watch can it see burn yeah you spots. can see the burn pattern and yeah it's it's it does not heat evenly at all. What it does is it heats evenly. Um, in the fourth dimension, which is time, right? <laughs> it heats evenly over time. It, it heats up slowly, it cools down slowly, and therefore it functions as like a regulator valve on your stove, um, so keeping your heat from kind of peaking or dipping in ways that could affect your food problematically, which is particularly a thing on electric stoves that cycle on and off, right? Um, and yeah, I had problems with that thin one burning my food, especially when I was cooking with it over uh, electric at the old house. So that's something that you notice right away. But generally, the reputation is just that the expensive brands simply last longer because the enamel doesn't chip. And then there's one other thing that I'll mention without mentioning any brands because I don't, I have no idea if any of this is true. It's just a reputation that's on the internet, which is that um, the glazes in the cheaper ones might have potentially problematically high levels of heavy metals in them, which is definitely true of like glass, like glass contains heavy metals for all kinds of reasons. And so that's not, 
that's something that's a problem you would expect to have with a glass coated piece of cookware that there could potentially be a lot of heavy metal in there that could leach into your food and cause health problems over time. So my advice is that like if you like pretty things and you have deep pockets, yes. Sh- sure, go for Le Creuset like we did and Yeah, I honestly like $575 for a pot. <laughs> Don't put it on your credit card. We wouldn't have done it if this wasn't my job, right? I mean. I mean, if we had the amount of money that we had because this is your job, I might have bought it because yeah. it lasts forever. It, I mean, we were going to have to replace the other one. Do we want to replace the other one and then in 15 years replace it again and then in 15 years replace it again? Then we've reached Le Creuset levels of cost and hopefully we will never replace that and it will – cost per use will work out. Mm-hmm. But like if you have to check your bank balance before you buy it, don't buy it. No. Don't put it on your credit card. Not you worth don't it. need yeah. it. But if you have the money for it and you like pretty things, they are very, very nice. Yeah. And if aesthetics are, are slightly less important to you, go with Staub. I um, will say the I do like um the glazes on this the stove. I like the the dusty blue and the dark green. I mm-hmm. think they're very pretty. And so it's on, not and- just like that one's ugly and the like, like, Crusades are pretty. And I don't know if they do it on all of their models, but on some of the models I've seen, they, they use a transparent glaze on the inside. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of black cast iron on the inside. It's just shiny because it's got the glass on top of it. And that looks cool too. Yeah, both both good options. Lots of good options. Regardless, it's like, you know, an enameled cast yeah. iron Dutch oven is, if I was going to have one thing, like one cooking vessel in our yeah. in our kitchen, it would probably be that. I mean, it can we do use it the everything. most. Yeah. Soups and roasts and all kinds of meat and yeah. things. Worth investing in. Bread. You can do bread in it. Right. You never do bread in it. Why not? Why do you never do bread? I, I got enough carbs. <laughs> <laughs> People on the internet are always making beautiful bread loaves in their like cruises. Mm-hmm. Couldn't be me. <laughs> well, um, I had a great transition line and then you totally like oh. ruined it by talking, <laughs> keeping your mouth yapping. <laughs> Women be talking. Women be talking. <laughs> but just as we but, were happy to invest in a quality piece of cookware, I'm so happy that the good folks at Trade Coffee have invested in the uh, Adam Ragusea family of programs. Uh, Trade is another sponsor of today's episode. Trade is a coffee subscription service that makes it super easy to discover new coffees that you would not have found uh, anywhere else. Fundamentally, what they do is they just partner with local roasters all around the United States. And they they have professional tasters who go out and look for interesting stuff and anything that makes the cut, they partner with that roaster. That roaster will be the one to send you a bag of coffee like the one I'm holding right now. Honey, do you want to open this up? Because normally I, I taste the coffees. Don't show the uh, our home address on the back to the people at home, if you can avoid it, who are watching on home video. Believe me, I absolutely will not. <laughs> yeah. But I thought it'd be fun to actually open this one kind of like live on mic. Well, this is nice because I don't drink coffee, but mm. I love the smell of coffee. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, these red bags that the trade coffee comes in are compostable, by the way, which is nice. And let's see, what do we got here? This is from Anodyne, Anodyne Roasting Company. That's a funny name, Anodyne Roasting. And Dark it, Roast Sumatra Mandeling. Yeah, well, that's um, that's an, an Indonesian word, no oh, doubt. Um, smells so- freaking awesome. Oh. This is great because I normally, most of my coffee is from Latin America, and I love Latin American coffee, obviously, but I could probably be trying more stuff from the other major growing region of the world, which is Indonesia. May um, uh, anodyne roasting coffee in coffee roasting. <laughs> Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. Miliwake. Yep. Miliwake. <laughs> from Sumatra to Miliwake to your door, because that's what trade does is, you know, you tell them about basically what you like, what kind of coffee you like, and then they find stuff that more or less matches that description and they send it to you and you just get to have it on whatever schedule is works for you, however much coffee you consume. You're never going to be out. You're always going to have enough. And it's just been such a, a source of unexpected delight in my life to have new cool things just show up. And this one tastes apparently of dark chocolate, smoke and clove. That sounds awesome. Um, And I can't wait to try it. 
um, you know, whatever you're into, Trade makes it easy and convenient to discover new coffees. What you want to do is you want to upgrade your morning routine. Just get your day started with a little bit of, of fun and self-care and pleasure. Right now, Trade is offering my uh, listeners a free bag of coffee with any subscription at drinktrade.com slash adamshow. That's drinktrade.com slash adamshow for a free bag with your subscription. Drinktrade.com slash adamshow. Thank you to the good folks at Trade Coffee for sponsoring the program. Hi, Adam. My name is Eliana. I live in Portugal, but I am originally from Colombia and I grew up eating avocados since I was a kid. In fact, when I was a kid, my mom used to tell me how when she was a kid, she ate bread with avocados. This is the first instance in my life that I heard about something similar to an avocado toast. And my question to you is, why don't you have more content in your channel that features avocados? Avocados are very popular these days, so I'm just curious to know, do you like avocados? Um, what's your take on them? Take that, David Brooks and other you know, people who make fun of avocado toast, okay, <laughs> and say that it's just an av an affectation of like mostly white American, you know, well-to-do millennials. Yes. Um, and uh, no, okay, Ileana's Colombian grandma or mom was it her mom? I think mom. Mom made avocado toast. So take that. Um, she probably didn't pay twenty three dollars for it, but <laughs> is it are people who's paying twenty three dollars for avocado toast? We've been to some restaurants here that have very expensive avocado toast on the menu. Wow. And you I mean, noticed they, they because- They put other stuff on there. Well, yeah, they do, they, yeah. They do other things, right? The money is not they, in the- They zhuzh it up. Well, mm -hmm. well, actually, the money probably isn't is in the avocado. avocados. Yeah. Avocados are expensive. They are hard to grow. Mm -hmm. um, avocados are the- It's technically a berry mm -hmm. from the- uh, It's a member of the laurel family, the mm -hmm. avocado tree, um, which would include like the cinnamon tree, I think. Um, I don't think it's called the cinnamon tree. It's <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Adam's brain just skipping down the path, just plucking ideas and facts out of the air. <laughs> this is what people come in for. for. This is the, that's the value proposition of the entire program. I mean, I know you don't listen, and I don't blame you. I wouldn't. Me? I yeah. No, sometimes. It's, it's okay. I don't blame you. <laughs> I mean, you sometimes I hear you doing it from upstairs. <laughs> you just, you just hear muffled <laughs> shouting through there. the floor. <laughs> you like avocados. I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you like about them? I like guacamole a lot. <laughs> um, they're, I like their texture and like their delivery device for excellent seasonings. Um. And we fed them to the kids a lot when they were little mm -hmm. before they decided to be picky because that's a good, like a good source of fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. A way to think of avocados is that it's kind of like nature's plant-based butter, right? Mm -hmm. The fat content is not as high as butter. I think the fat content of avocado flesh is something like 30% or 40%, mm -hmm. something like that. But it's like the good kind of fat. Yeah. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's all probably, mm -hmm. probably healthy fat, but of course, uh, nutritional needs yeah. vary on the, on the individual level. And mm -hmm. we do not dispense advice on this program. <laughs> sure. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yada, yada, yada. Et cetera. <laughs> um, fun fact. So the original avocado like the wild avocado prior to domestication, it was domesticated in Mexico or Guatemala like 5,000 years ago. Um, prior to domestication, the original avocado had that kind of oily flesh layer, right? So you've got like a, like any other fruit, you've got like a peel, mm -hmm. a hard peel on the outside of skin, the exocarp. Then you've got kind of a fleshy middle mesocarp. And that's usually the part we eat. And then there's the seed at the mm. center, right? I have to ask you a question. What's up? The scientific names for the parts of the berry. Uh -huh. Did you look up those before we did this? Or is that just on the tip of your tongue? I do this for a living. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm impressed. I didn't. Hmm. Cool. It might be wrong, but I said it with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I like, believe you. 
<laughs> when you eat like a cherry, right? The like the fleshy part on the inside, that's probably I think the mesocarp. <laughs> um like that's the part you eat, right? Like the equivalent of that in the in the avocado berry is the green fatty part. Mm. And it's just it's just What's weird about it is that instead of storing most of the plant's energy in the form of sugar, which is, you know, common with the other berries we eat, the avocado tree chooses its life choice. Its lifestyle is to store most of its energy as fat inside mm-hmm. its the, 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 the fruit, the flesh of its fruit. And, and you don't like avocados very much. Well, you know who did, apparently? It, uh, historic extinct megafauna. Because the original wild avocado had a very, very thin mesocarp, but still a giant seed, all right? Mm -hmm. So not much flesh on it, but still that absolutely gigantic seed that like you're not going to swallow and then hole and then poop out somewhere where it can grow into a new tree, Mm -hmm. which is the main reason, like that's that's how these kinds of trees do their seed dispersal Mm -hmm. is that they trick animals into swallowing their seeds whole and then pooping them out somewhere else where they can grow into a new tree. Um, like there's no, no animal is going to be swallowing an avocado pit whole now, but it's thought that the avocado co-evolved with maybe giant sloths or other now extinct megafauna that were large enough to swallow the seed whole. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and then whenever the, the giant sloths died out, it was sort of left as like a, an orphan, um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe did not propagate or do so well in its native habitat until, um, you know, ancient indigenous people in Mexico and Guatemala noticed it and started selecting for fruit that was, had, had a thicker mesocarp. Um, I feel like when Eliana asked why you don't use avocados very much on your channel, she did not see giant sloths <laughs> as an answer. So you're just saying <laughs> I should shut up and answer her damn no, question? No, 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 no. I just think it's funny. I... I love the texture, right? That smooth texture that they have. Mm -hmm. And and part of it, I mean, it's like most avocados I've ever had are Haas avocados, which Mm -hmm. is the particular variety that was isolated in California Mm -hmm. about 100 years ago, like pretty recently, Mm -hmm. and is largely propagated by grafting. Like it's cloned, right? We're just eating clones of the same original tree uh, from California, the Haas tree. And so maybe, you know, maybe other avocado varieties would, would surprise me with their intensity of taste, but it just kind of bugs me how bland it is. Like it just doesn't taste like anything. And as a delivery source for more flavorful things like lime juice and garlic, yeah, hells yeah, I love it. But then again, like I'm not in a situation where I feel like I want to be seeking out particularly fatty foods. Although p- <laughs> probably like the fats in an avocado would be way better for me than the other fats that I get. So maybe yeah. I should just get over it. And... I love guacamole. I also really like avocados on sandwiches. Yeah. Avocados. Remember the chacarero in Boston? Oh, the Had a... chacarero. Mm, so, so this was a sandwich shop in downtown Crossing, in which is a it's downtown neighborhood in Boston. Mm. And it's it's an Argentinian sandwich, isn't it? I think so. Okay, Some, from somewhere Chicken in South America, with like a spicy brine on it. Um, and the really surprising thing was green beans. Yeah, string beans. It had was it monster cheese? Monster cheese. Monster cheese. Um, and then um, an av- avocado spread, and the bread was this big, round, white, kind of flat, soft deliciousness. Yeah. I think that that's a traditional sandwich in Argentina. Um, And we should do a whole thing about that at some point. Oh, so good. But yeah, you got the avocados on Mm -hmm. it. Avocados, very good on sandwiches, particularly good if like you're vegan, because it's a great, I mean, A, it's just a good source of dietary fat for you. And B, it's like, it's like a, it's like a, it's it's a sandwichable form of fat, Mm -hmm. which you don't really have a lot if you don't eat any animal products. Um, I think the reason you don't feature avocados on your channel that often is because you don't make that many sort of cold prep foods. Mm. And avocados, not really, I mean, you can like fry them, I guess. Yeah. But um, they're not really a, like a hot food situation unless mm-hmm. you put them atop something and you don't really do that. And also, 
avocados are really hot. Like you shoot on a certain day and like to have, you have to have the avocado ripe. Yeah, yeah. So avocados. (laughs) They're temperamental things. Avocados are like bananas in the sense that they, the fruit matures entirely on the tree. It won't keep growing after you take Mm -hmm. it off, but it does continue. it, it, It only ripens off the tree. And... Yeah, it's tricky to kind of get it to ex- time it right. To time yeah. it right where it's perfectly soft on the day you want to eat but it, but not brown. Yeah. Also, yeah, I don't make a lot of like cold prep sandwiches on the channel or whatever, mainly because I associate them with uh, food poisoning, true food poisoning, oh. and that's how I landed the sh- the pod ship right back where it took off. Always, wow! I that's, did it. I'm impressed. It's the transitions and the the, the landings. He always sticks the landing, this one. This one. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with Lauren and myself for the Adam Ragusea pod. If you have a question or other thing that you want to verbalize for a future episode, go to uh, send an email to askadamquestions at gmail, askadamquestions at gmail.com. Uh, att- attach a video or an audio file to your email and do me a favor and type up a little bit about uh, what you said in the body or the subject line. And uh, yeah, we have like, 50 seconds before the camera time's off. Anything you want to say to the people? Um, When we get to episode 100 of the podcast, I was saying we should do something cool and I don't know what the answer is. So if you have ideas for what would be fun to do a year from now for the 100th episode of the podcast. Hundo. Let's hear it. Yeah. Good idea. Thank you for joining us, honey. Of course. Make good choices. Talk to you next time. Pshh.